Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with the second session of the um, Breakout Awaken Conference. Um, I'm pretty excited to introduce our next speaker. Sherry Hall um, has been a big part of my recovery, and she allowed God to uh, work through her and actually part of was saving my life. So pretty uh, special lady. She is uh, married with two grown and married children, and she has a husband and has been married to Mike for 32 years. They run a small nonprofit uh, called Project Hope, which runs Celebrate Recovery, the prison ministry, the jail ministry, and her biblical mentoring. And she also writes a blog on the kinds of counseling issues, and it's called SherryHallBlog.com. There's some really um, good information. I've had people uh, mention to me that they learned a lot from it, and it's affected their lives. And so without any further ado, we'll ask Sherry to come up here and talk about healthy relationships. Thank you, Christy. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning here that once I have really learned about what healthy relationships are, I cannot watch love movies anymore. It's ruined me. The other day, my husband was watching The Born Identity, right? And she meets this guy who just happens to be walking down the street with $10,000 in his pocket, right? What is that about, right? Who does that, right? Then the police sirens go past, and he's like, he's hiding from police sirens, okay? She lets him get into the car, okay? Talk about red flags, right? Okay, these are like, these aren't red flags. These are fire pits, right? She lets him get into the car. You know, scenes go past, right? They're sitting in, together in this car. He's telling her, you need to get out. I am no good for you. The police are after me. This is trouble. What does she do? She buckles up. <laughs> right? What is that saying? That's saying to us that true love will go through anything. Guess what? That's not true love. She should have gotten out. <laughs> I sit there going, get out, get out. You can do it. <laughs> but no, no, she buckled up. And unfortunately, she ended up dying in that movie, didn't she? So looking at these red flags is like really, really important. Okay? So today I am going to be talking about what does it take to, to make a good, healthy relationship. All right? So... Obviously, there are books on this, there are seminars on this that last hours and hours. I'm not going to even be able to touch the surface of all the good information that is out there. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about communication or sex, or um, I'm going to just touch on conflict resolution, just one, one little thing. Uh, so please know that there's a lot more information out there than, uh, than what I'm talking on today. But I do get a lot of people that come into my, my mentoring, my counseling room, and we talk about what does make a good, healthy relationship. And one of the things that I'm listening for as I am listening to somebody's story is, is this actually a relationship problem, or is it a personal problem that is affecting the relationship? Those are two really big differences in how you're going to deal with them. So relationship problems are things like conflict, you know, differing values. Somebody might value time alone where another person values togetherness, right? Those are different values. Uh, somebody might value things. Another person might value um, activities, right? That's something my husband and I, I love to have stuff, and my husband loves to do stuff, right? Uh, communication or miscommunication can be really a, a difficult relationship thing. Sex is obviously one of those very hot topics that 
um, can cause a lot of relationship hurt and pain. But some of the things that are personal problems that affect the relationship really are addictions, right? Somebody's addicted to something in the marriage and it's causing problems. Anger, they don't know how to deal with their emotions. Deceit, we talked uh, about that with red flags. Somebody is overly fearful. They don't want to go outside of their house. Well, that can affect the relationship. Uh, being too independent or too codependent. An inability to express emotion at all. Maybe they're just shut down completely. Depression. Now, lots of people, they have, they're married to a person who suffers from depression, and that can affect the marriage. So really being able to separate what is my part, what is their part, and what's God's part. That's a lot of what we do in marriage counseling is separating out whose part is what. Okay. In Scripture, a lot of people get this kind of messed up. It says the two shall become one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we leave our individuality behind, right? They're talking about the sexual union right there in that scripture. Uh, we still need to keep our own identities, all right? And we can th even think of the Trinity. The Trinity has the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. They each have their own roles, don't they? But they are one. And so just because we get married does not mean that you lose your identity as who you are as an individual, all right? Relationship problems exist when I am indifferent to you or when I am enmeshed as one with you. So under-involvement or over-involvement with each other. Another word for under-involvement is neglect. Paying little or no attention, uh, remiss in care. I don't care if you eat. I don't care if you, whatever you do, I don't care about you, right? Being indifferent. Withholding affection. The cold shoulder. That's a, that's a bad one, actually. Uh, infidelity, abandonment, refusing to provide financial support, not helping each other out in difficult times. All of these are neglect. And then there's, a, there's the other side of neglect is over-enmeshment. And this causes a lot of problems. There's two lies in over-enmeshment. The first lie is, it is my responsibility to make sure everyone in my family is happy. And I believe that I have the power to do that. The second lie is, everybody in my family is responsible to make me happy. And they have the power to do that. What's interesting about that is consequently, everyone is responsible for everybody else and no one is responsible for himself. And so we have this emotional enmeshment that plays out in everybody's trying to control everybody else and nobody's responsible. That causes a lot of problems. So, how do we look at relationship? Okay, so the first, the overarching concept here is mutuality. It's individuality and togetherness. And that gets complicated sometimes. Independence, I want to go do my own thing, you can do whatever you want, is not really relationship, is it? But codependence, this enmeshment, is negative to relationship as well. So we are not, here's, a, here's the catch phrase, we are not responsible for each other, but we are responsible to each other, okay? I'm not responsible for my husband's emotions, for how, what he does. I'm not responsible for his task list. I'm not responsible to make him happy. And he's not responsible for those things for me. But I am responsible to my husband that I am going to do what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to uh, take care of myself. I'm going to have my own task list and do what I say. So I'm responsible 
to my husband, but not for him, okay? So under mutuality, we have reciprocity. It means that both individuals contribute specific qualities essential for the care, maintenance, and repair of the relationship. They are honesty, caring, respect, responsibility, and repentance. In marriage, both individuals make efforts to grow and change for the welfare of the other and the preservation of their relationship. Both people in the relationship give and both people receive. Power and responsibility are shared and there is not a double standard where one person gets all the goodies and the other person sacrificially does most of the work. All right, and we see this. On the back of the handouts that I handed out to you today, I listed 50 verses that talk about one another. Okay, we are supposed to love one another, serve one another, meet with one another, greet one another, right? There are over at least 50 verses that talk about this one anothering, how we are to um, care for other people. All of those 50 verses do not go away when we get married and get summed up in the submission verse or the headship verse, okay? We have to look at the submission verse and the headship verse in the context of the one anothering, okay, in the mutuality of it. The second part of mutuality is voice. Voice means that in your marriage, you are allowed to make choices, to give input, and to express your feelings. Without fear of badgering, manipulated, mani manipulation, and punishment. When freedom is present, we're not afraid to be ourselves, nor are we pressured to become something that we're not. Okay? So I need to be able to have my opinions. I need to be able to have my goals. I need to be able to pursue what I believe God is calling me to pursue. And we see this in, I'm going to list off of several references here so you can take down these references if you want. 1 Peter 3.7, it says, Live with your wife in an understanding way so that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, if, if you are badgering and trying to control, don't be surprised if God is not listening to your prayers. 1 Peter 4.5 says, But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We will stand before God one day, ready to give an account. I am responsible for me. You know, I'm going to be giving God an account as a wife, right? That I was a wife here on earth. But not for his choices. I'm going to be giving an account for my own choices. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one is given a special gift to use, to use it to serve one another. Okay? So I'm, I'm responsible to use the giftings that God has given me to serve the body of Christ, to serve my family, to serve my husband, to serve him, God, right? So that means I need to be able to make those choices to do that. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Okay? Again, I'm going to stand before God. This is, this is my my works that I'm doing. And Romans 14.14 14 says, So then each one of us will give an account of God to himself. We need to be able to speak up. That does not mean that our spouse has to agree with us. That's not what it means. But it means that I need to be heard and I need to hear my spouse. And we need to be able to come to a resolution uh, which leads us to the third point, which is conflict. Now, conflict is a big subject. Uh, I actually have led a class, an eight-week class on conflict, and so there's books written on it. There are healthy ways to deal with conflict. I just want you to know that. If you don't know how to deal with conflict, that is a great thing to pursue, okay? But I'm going to read you this quote by Dr. Pallison. He says, 
To be impartial, which is referred to in James 3.17, it is a quality to be able to talk about my own failings without defensiveness and self-righteousness and also without self-loathing. Oh, it's all my fault. I'm such a horrible person, right? We need to be able to talk about our own failings this way. So neither with self-loathing, self-defensiveness, or pride, all right? And I am able to talk about your failings without accusation and condemnation. It's a way for us to talk together about what, we just went, what, about what just went wrong. That is a gift to live and die for. It's a form of wisdom that God is very committed to give us. And it's very hard earned. You only learn by its failing and then being picked up by the grace of God who gives more grace. All right, so this is really important in conflict. Most of the time in conflict, we want to win. I want to be heard and I want my way. All right? The goal of conflict is not to win. Okay, the goal of conflict is to come and to a mutual answer that both people are able to live with and be happy with. All right. Fourth area of mutuality is going to be healthy boundaries. Some people, it was touched on in the last talk, but some people believe that a healthy boundary is a big fat wall and I am going to cast anybody out who doesn't do things my way on the other side of the wall. Okay? That is not a healthy boundary. A healthy boundary is a decision that I'm going to make given somebody else's actions that are intruding on my freedoms, my voice. All right? I always like to think of it as inviting somebody into the land of healthy. You know, we aren't doing... I might say to a person, whatever we're doing right now isn't working. So I'm going to stop doing what, I'm not going to play this game anymore. I'm going to stop. I'm going to leave. I'm going to do whatever, hang the phone up, right? But I will meet you over in the land of healthy. So if you want to come over there with me, then come on, and we can have a relationship over there. But whatever we're doing right now, we're stopping that. Okay? So that's that's the idea of a healthy boundary. And I'm going to give you the trick to making boundaries effective. You have to hold them kindly. If you get pissed and you just march off and you say, I'm not doing this anymore, and you slam the door on the way out, guess what? They get to say, look at her. She's crazy. She's, got, she's messed up. And they never have to look at themselves. All right? But if you say, you know, I said that I wasn't going to be talking to you this way anymore. I wasn't going to engage with you anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and leave. And if you get up and you just calmly walk out, they're left sitting in their mess. And they actually have to think about it. So it's really the only way that a boundary could actually be effective if it's going to be effective. Okay, sometimes you can hold a boundary and it doesn't really have an effect on the other person, in which case nothing that you would have done is going to have an effect. So the only thing that I have seen that makes a a bad relationship enter into a good relationship is being able to hold a boundary kindly. All right. So we see this in Scripture. We see 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads to an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. So he's saying, don't associate with people who are unruly, right? Okay. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. If anyone is willing to... I'm sorry. If anyone is not willing to work, neither shall he eat, Right? So you've got a teenage son who's not willing to get off the couch and do anything? 
Guess what, son? <laughs> you don't work, you don't eat. There's a boundary, because I'm providing the food, right? So I get to make the decision that I'm not providing food until the work is done. It's not real complicated, is it? Now, that doesn't mean it isn't hard to do, because it is hard to do. It's just not complicated. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 says, If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him. Boundary, right? So that he will, not, so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay? So don't, don't get mad, right? Don't be angry in this. Just, just know that there are limitations here. And then, of course, we see that God provided boundaries for us in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He said, you know what? If you eat from the tree, I'm going to have to not let you stay here. So we see that God has provided uh, boundaries for us as well. All right. Fifth area of mutuality is manipulation and honor. All right? We're going to go to the honor side. Um, I've got a great little story here to read to you. This is a random act of manipulation. It comes from the book Marriage Matters by Winston Smith, and I highly recommend this book. It's a great book. Um, Winston is the counselor in this story. Howard, a counselee, stood in the checkout line of a grocery store. In front of him was an elderly woman dug through her change purse. You're short, 73 cents, the cashier informed the woman. I'm sure I have it in here somewhere, the woman explained as she began dropping pennies onto the countertop. She looked apologetic at the line behind her and continued digging through her purse in search of anything bigger than a nickel. A few moments later, Howard leaned forward, handed her a dollar bill, and said quietly, Take this, it's okay. The woman looked up with a sheepish grin, uttered a quiet thank you, and quickly paid the cashier. As Howard shared the, his story, I wondered if something had clicked. I'd been challenging him on his attitude toward his wife and was not sure if anything was making sense. That's encouraging, Howard, I remarked. It sounds like you saw an opportunity to love someone in a simple, concrete way and acted on it. No, Howard answered. I saw an old woman in my way, and I realized that the quickest way to get rid of her was to give her a dollar. Oh, I responded, suddenly not at all sure where this was going. I know that woman walked away thinking that I did a nice thing for her, but I didn't. I didn't love her. I just wanted her out of my way. So what does that mean, I asked. It means I'm a selfish jerk, he said. <laughs> Howard didn't see a person in front of him at the grocery store. He saw an object, an obstacle to his goals. The difference between people and things is that love requires us to treat people at, with an honor and a respect that we don't give to things. Unlike things, all people share three characteristics. They have a unique identity and purpose. They are free to make responsible choices. And they have worth. Okay. I'm going to bet that that story probably tagged all of us. I know it tagged me. Sometimes we just want what we want. And if we can even play nice to get it, what are we doing? We're manipulating, aren't we? We're manipulating to get what we want. And it's not actions out of love. So we are going to look at this whole concept of honor versus manipulation here. So to honor is loving others as yourself. Manipulation is punishment, or it can be favoritism. Uh, Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. And James 3.16, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. So we really do need to think through our relationships and ask ourselves, how am I being selfish in this relationship? All right, so to honor means you, I view my spouse belongs to God. 
Manipulation says he exists to serve me. Honor is you are made in the image of God. Manipulation is you're an object to be used. Honor is I give without expectation. Manipulation is I give to get. Honor is I want you to be successful. Manipulation is I need you to make me happy. Honor listens. It listens to hear. Manipulation shuts you down, talks over you. All right? In our relationships with other people, there are three patterns that we can actually move in. All right? One is moving towards others. One is moving away from others. And one is moving against others. All right? What's interesting about this is that we can manipulate in all three ways and we can honor in all three ways. All right? So let's look at that. To move toward others, manipulation says, I crave for approval, affection. I can use charm, talent, or I can use pouting. I can move toward you and pout in your face. I'm not getting my way, right? What is that? That's manipulation, right? Moving toward others for mutual care and concern, right? It's mutual care and concern. I do expect my husband to care for my emotions, for the things that I need to get done, and I want to do the same for him. That's mutual, and that's good. We can move away from others. We can crave peace, right? Oh, man, this guy is going to cause a problem, so I'm just going to run away. That's moving away from others. Or I can control the situation. You know what? I'm going to move away, and I'm going to be able to control the situation here. Um, or I want order. So, you know, I've got, to, I've got to do all the planning, and you can't be a part of it. To honor people in moving away from others, we don't participate in the evil or abuse that they're perpetrating, right? So we move away from them. That's actually loving them. To, if they are continuing in negative patterns, then sometimes that's what we need to do, is to say, no more. Uh, I can't participate in that any longer. And we can do that in love. To move against others, we can crave for superiority, success, power. Uh, we use anger to move against somebody. Uh, we can cause them to fail, right? There's uh, different scenarios where you just keep setting them up for failure. Uh, we lie. That's moving against somebody. But we can honor somebody by moving against them as well. Uh, not to that person's detriment, but to challenge sinful behavior. So there's actually going to be times when you move against them by calling the police, right? You move against them by saying, I can't have contact with you anymore, right? I guess that's moving away from others. Um, so all three, so it isn't the moving towards others, away from others, or against others that's wrong or bad. We need to be able to use all three of those, but using them to honor people, not to manipulate them for our, our good, for our interests only. All right? So those are the five different patterns or um, topics under mutuality. Basically, we want to be able to, in a healthy, any healthy relationship, this is the starting point, right? There's lots of things to be talked with about after, uh, uh, regarding healthy relationships, but this is the starting place that we're going to consider each other mutual fellow heirs in Christ, fellow people who have goodwill towards each other, wanting the best. And from there, we can begin to talk about communication issues or other things of that nature. So, I am ready for any questions. 
He's typing them into the computer now. Ah. Oh, there's my quote. I'll read it. Remember, love doesn't mean being your spouse's yes man, but rather being determined to do what's best for him that doesn't always make other people happy. Okay, so our goal isn't to necessarily make our spouse happy, but our goal is to do the absolute best for them. Okay. That's, that can be a challenge sometimes to even figure out what that looks like and what is that, what does that mean, right? I know in my personal life I have struggled with moving against somebody and not being angry, but doing it for them. That's a real struggle to be able to do that in kindness, um, moving against them or even away from them. So that's a challenge. You have any questions? Okay. What is the, what is the difference between equality and mutuality? Well, equality, I would classify that we are, is the same, okay? And we aren't the same, are we? Different people have different qualities about them, different giftings, different education levels, right? My husband is a lot smarter than I am. I'm just going to say that, right? Mechanically, he can fix almost anything. He, you know, he's never been trained in that, but I just look at it and I go, oh, it's broke, got to throw it away, right? Uh, so equality does not mean that we are the same. So mutuality is that we take our differences and we honor them. We say, yeah, you are good at that, and I'm not, and vice versa, okay? We have another one? Okay, what are some, what are some examples of healthy boundaries in marriage? All right. Um, you know, oftentimes, there is a big difference in sexual drive. For instance, one party it has a stronger sexual drive than the other. And here again, it shouldn't be based on the person who wants it the most, right? It's honoring, it's listening to, it's making adjustments, consideration. Um, we, we, the person with a stronger sexual drive is going to say, you know, maybe I can pace myself a little bit here. Um, I can honor my spouse's exhaustion. Uh, we can plan for a time uh, where we're both ready for that. And the person who is exhausted, maybe they're too busy, maybe they're, they don't have as strong of an interest in it, can develop an interest. And they need to be able to say, you know what, this is important to my husband or to my wife, right? And... I need to be able to pay attention to it and reserve energy for it. All right, so there's an example. So how do, you, how do you have a healthy boundary there? I would say in, that, in those situations that um, maybe the healthy boundary is we need to plan a time. It's not just in the middle of the night you wake me up, right? <laughs> okay. Maybe it's um, you, you, you gauge... What's going to be a little bit much for one person and what's not going to be enough for another? And you meet somewhere in the middle and you say, this is how we're going to do it. And you make a plan. You talk about it. Communication. Another healthy boundary. Let's see. Um, communication. My husband and I have a great boundary for each other. We do not talk about anything before coffee. <laughs> right? Like, we don't talk about schedules, we don't talk about money, nothing. My, and that's for my husband's sake, right? For my sake, we don't talk about anything after 8.30 at night, right? Because, like, I'm going to say th things are going to come out of my mouth that just don't make sense. And he's going to say, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so we have this healthy boundary. Every once in a while, we'll find that we, we've crossed that boundary, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, my husband, my husband actually got up and he started the conversation before coffee. And I was like, what are you doing? It's before coffee. <laughs> right? All right, do we have any more? Okay, what if my spouse is a yes man because they struggle with conflict? 
How do I honor them and challenge them to challenge me? Hmm, that's a good one. I like being able to set up a time when you know that there's going to be conflict. So oftentimes, um, you know, my husband and I for years, we don't do this so much anymore, I think because we've gotten used to doing this, but we would say, okay, Sunday nights after dinner, we're going to just hash out anything that needs to get hashed out. This, that will be our time. And that seemed to go really well for us because then we could both prepare for that kind of a conversation. Um, both, uh, both of us could just be able to say, okay, this is, we're going to spend this hour, we're going to talk about these things, and then it's going to be over for the week. It just helped us to do that. The other thing is um, sometimes if something has to come up in the middle of the week, I will give my husband, you know, several hours notice. So, hun, after dinner tonight, I need to talk to you about three or four things that need to get fixed in the house, right? I always know that's a big topic for him, right? What? We need fixing things? Ah. Uh, and so, you know, and money is a big topic for us. We've learned to pray before we talk about financial situations, which has really helped us. Um, but we also set each other up for, hey, I need to talk to you about some budget things. Can we do that tomorrow after dinner? Sure. Okay? It sets us up for a good, everybody's ready for that conversation. Because if I'm doing the dishes and I've got this and I've got to call that, make that phone call, and then he comes at me with some financial problem, right? Ah, I'm going to go crazy. Okay? So we, we set each other up for success. What if my husband is doing something unhealthy but not evil? Is it okay to resist him? Ooh, that's going to be a hot topic. Hmm. Well, you certainly don't have to participate in it. Um, it's not evil, meaning I'm going to guess that like there's no Bible reference to it. Um, not evil, but it's unhealthy. To a certain degree... Um, I think you have to let your spouse do unhealthy things and suffer the consequences of that themselves. Um, and I'm thinking of things like, you know, drinking too much soda, right? Um, or not exercising, right? Or those kinds of unhealthy things, right? Um, maybe, maybe if they have an over-anger problem, that's unhealthy. Um, but that would... That would seep on me, I would think. Um, and then I can have boundaries in that set, you know. If it's something that's unhealthy that's kind of dripping on me, I can have boundaries in that. Uh, I'm not going to participate in it. I'm not going to stay in the house when that's happening. Um, but I think if there is, if it's not illegal, if it's not evil, I think that we need to let our, our spouses deal with that stuff. All right. For the most part, there's probably some <laughs> caveat there that I would disagree with myself on that. But all right. We're typing. What's that? Are oh, you typing? Okay. Yeah. Okay. What is the one thing to have? A healthy relationship. What is the one thing to have a healthy relationship? Well, I think I talked about it today. It's mutuality, right? It's respecting the other person as an individual um, and being responsible to them, not for them. I think that if I was going to sum it all up, right, that'd be the number one. Unless something other number one comes to my mind, but <laughs> that's it for right now. Any more? I think that's it. Okay. All right. So that is Healthy Relationships. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you coming out and hearing these things. If you have any other questions for Claire, Peter, or myself, we'd be happy to answer those afterwards. Um, and hopefully uh, we're going to be planning a bigger conference in the spring, so you can stay tuned for that. Um, so thanks. Thanks for joining